Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer, right. and my guest this week is Bert Harding. Uh, Bert lives in Vancouver, right? And uh, I, he was recommended to me by several listeners. This, this often happens these days where people recommend that I interview somebody, and, and there's, there's no paucity of people to interview who have had an, a, a spiritual awakening. Um, right. The que- my pro- main problem is prioritizing them, so I keep sending them back. Okay, well, which one should I do first? But uh, you were fairly highly prioritized, <laughs> so so here we are. Um, <clears throat> so Bert, maybe you could just start by just giving us a, a quick little sketch okay. about uh, you know about yourself, and then we can maybe go delve into your spiritual sure. odyssey, um, whatever it has been. Yeah, my background years. has been physical. Um, I was a physiotherapist in Toronto. Um, I wasn't happy at the time because I um, too many demands were placed upon me. It was an exclusive club and the membership had to be renewed all the time. So I became a salesman rather than a physiotherapist. <laughs> mm. Anyway, so um, one morning on going to work at uh, on a Saturday, uh, I had a vision. Uh, believe it or not, and uh, it, I saw this incredible radiant face of an elderly gentleman, and um, and it didn't last more than maybe half a minute. But the wonderful thing was that um, it stayed with me for a long time. After a few months, I began to think it was a hallucination. Then six months down the road, I was walking in Yorkville, uh, Toronto. I entered the bookstore, and uh, I saw this picture of this man that appeared to me on the cover of a book and it was called Ramana Maharshi and his ah. teachings and um, when I saw the book uh, <laughs> I, I fell in love I, I, I just I just fell in love I read the book uh, it was a one dollar ninety five it was a hundred page booklet and uh, anyway I read it all night and I didn't sleep. The next morning, I went to work and I quit my job. <laughs> I uh, I retired to a basement apartment. I had earned enough, invested enough to to be able to live modestly, mm-hmm. and I didn't want to do anything. Just meditate, chant his name, and uh, mm-hmm. and that's all I did for about nine months. I was extremely happy and at peace. Something happened that moved me when I saw his picture. That this was real. Mm. You know, it wasn't hallucination, and um, it, uh, it's hard to describe, you know, it, it's, it was an amazing thing. Anyway, um, um, I began to uh, sit in meditation for too long, quietly living inside. Um, I needed to start exercising. I started doing yoga. Then uh, a man from YMCA, scout, I guess you would call him, he saw me and he asked me if I would give yoga classes and um, within a short period of time I was giving 13 classes a week Uh then CBC had a program called Food for Thought and um, they liked what I was doing Um, and so they interviewed me on CBC Food for Thought and um, there were no computers at the time no email so many phone calls were coming in and many letters coming in they interviewed me again for half an hour, and after that, uh, CFTO approached me, and we did a TV series, and I wrote a book called "Be Aware, Be Free," and that mm-hmm. started the ball rolling. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. After my TV series, I came to Vancouver uh, because I wanted to travel. I wanted to see the uh, West Coast, and I fell in love with Vancouver. Mm. I just, you know, as soon as I arrived here, I thought, "Oh, this, this is it. This is my place." And um, and I started holding classes here. At, uh, I started first at CBC, which is uh, I'm not CBC, sorry, <laughs> UBC, mm-hmm. the University of British Columbia, and um, and at my place. Mm-hmm. So that was how it, it went. Hmm. So when you had this experience um, then, um, of Ramana, when you were walking down the street in Toronto and you saw this man's face in your mind's eye. Had you had a, any sort of like spiritual background up to that point, or were you just sort of a regular Joe with a physio- physical therapist, and all of a sudden um, you saw this face? Always, I was always interested asking questions. Mm-hmm. 
when I was a teenager, I used to suffer tremendously from loneliness. I used to have these incredible feelings of loneliness. But it was later, after getting to know Ramana Maharshi and his teachings, that what I was experiencing, it wasn't really loneliness, it was the expansion of my vastness, but I separated from it, and I saw I felt like an individual separate from the whole. Hmm. And so it felt like loneliness, and it was through that that I began to understand very deeply what I was asking uh, all the time. I had these questions. I was interested in psychology, mm -hmm. but it never occurred to me the depth by which uh, came to me after this, uh, you know, teaching of Bhagavan Ramana Maharshi. However, I must state this, that although I, um, I became a teacher and uh, I wrote this book and I appeared on TV, it wasn't until I arrived in Vancouver and I had a relationship uh, in the year 2000 that uh, it became so difficult, this relationship, that I felt like um, <laughs> catch-22, you know, damned if I do, damned if I don't, there was, you know, and I realized at that moment that all I knew was what I read and what I heard. Mm. And uh, I realized how ignorant I was and um, strange as it may seem, it was that very awareness of my own unknowing at the moment that opened me up to the fact that I am a, I'm a human being, mm -hmm. a being playing the human role of bird. Mm -hmm. and, um, and this became my basic teaching. I called it super sentience. Uh, super sentience means you are an aware being and to be aware that you're aware is I call it super sentience so are you saying so that became uh, so were you saying yeah. are you saying that um, you know you became aware of how ignorant you were uh, was it sort of like there had been a sort of a spiritual unfoldment on on uh, one level but that as a human being uh, on that level you felt inadequate or, or ignorant. In other words, somehow the, the connection between the, your vast inner self level and your more kind of concrete human level wasn't, wasn't tight. It wasn't a good connection. There yeah, was something uh, missing. Uh, um, yeah, there was the, what was missing was the fact that everything that I knew, even though it was very moving, it touched me and it changed my life with Bhagavan's appearance, Mm -hmm. Yet it was still intellectual. Mm. Hadn't it was really still what I said from. Hadn't really kind yeah, of integrated on the gut level. It was more that up, up the in the head. Uh -huh. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wasn't living from it mm. um, until the year two thousand. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying that in the year two thousand, it somehow shifted from <clears throat> just being an intellectual, conceptual thing into more of an experiential thing. Right. Exactly. Yes. Okay. Yes. And was it and this difficult I, relationship that, that uh, was the catalyst for that shift, or was there something more yes, to it? Yes, I would say that because it, um, I, was, I, I had it always easy, you know, mm -hmm. whether it was a relationship or anything. I just, you know, I had a very comfortable life after my, uh, my vision of Bhagavan Ramana Maharshi. I, I became my own boss, even uh, when I appeared on TV or wrote a book. I, I was very comfortable doing my own thing. But um, and then I began to feel that I'm a teacher now and I'm awake. Um, but the, the thing is that um, what I realized here is that, uh, how shall I put it? All I knew is what I've read, what I've heard, um, what other people told me, the teachings of others. But again, use the word integration like you did. Um, I didn't integrate it in my life so that I live from it. Yeah. So you were just kind of parroting other people's words in a way. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. I didn't know at the time. I thought I knew. Right. You know, but um, but it, it didn't really settle hmm. that I was living it. I wonder until... that sometimes about a lot of teachers. I, I, I don't, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt, you know, and not be a doubting Thomas, but I, I wonder sometimes whether they have, have just sort of 
gotten themselves so absorbed in intellectual concepts that they have mistaken those for the experience to which those concepts point and that they're not really living it in a nitty-gritty way. And I'm really not qualified to judge, but I always have that little suspicion, you know. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize it until then, too, that um, even some people have written books, spiritual books, who themselves were not really living what they had written about. Yeah. And uh, this is not their fault, it's just that it, it does happen that way. We begin to think we really know until we are faced with what is it that we really know. Because really there's nothing to know, you are, you just are. Mm -hmm. You are a presence, you are awareness, you are here now forever. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's not something to learn, but it's something to unlearn. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. It's more of for it's a it's more of a cleansing really from the conditioning rather than learning something new because when we sit very still when we look at who we are it is so obvious mm -hmm. here I am looking at you mm -hmm. and uh, we are conversing now mm -hmm. and you're I don't know where are you from Idaho I'm in Iowa I Iowa Iowa okay yes. that's several hundred miles from here. Quite a few, uh, so a couple of thousand miles from there, actually. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm like four or five hours west of Chicago. Yeah, you see, and here we are talking together, here now, this very moment, mm -hmm. transcending time and space. Mm -hmm. You see? Yeah. I mean, this is, this is the miracle itself, that there's only now, there's only this moment, this, this presence. Mm -hmm. And so this is what settled with me, that everything I've read... <clears throat> um, wasn't quite the impact of what I felt in that year 2000 when I realized that I didn't know anything. Here I am stuck. I can't even solve this little problem. <laughs> and I opened myself up, I surrendered, and I said, okay, Bhagavan, <laughs> guide me, I'm helpless. Uh -huh. It's amazing that little surrender somehow uh, took over and uh, showed me how simple it, it really is. Huh. You're always here, you're always now, there's nothing else, and it's it's eternal. You were never born, you'll never die, you're just here, always. Right. And to look at that and to... Um, it is not that difficult to actually realize it. And so know? what you're saying is that now that's, experience, <clears throat> that's experiential, you're not just articulating a, a concept anymore, you're saying that is your 24-7 oh, no, experience. This is it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. This, this, this is yeah. And this is it. was that realization uh, sort of uh, abrupt or sudden uh, when you had that sort of realization that you had just been in your head, or did it take some working out over a period of years to sort of really? It didn't. No, it didn't uh, take time to work out. I never had anything like that before, um, because I'm rather an intellectual person as a rule. At least prior to that, anyway. And uh -huh. uh, now, what happened is I was extremely frustrated, exasperated. I didn't know what to do. And uh, so I went to the washroom, and there was this incredible fear that I really don't know anything. I was pretending all the time. Here I was, I appeared on television, I wrote a book. People think I am so smart, <laughs> aware, and, and I really am not. And, um, and it was a shock. It, it was a real uh, ego crusher, and mm -hmm. um, but it was so essential, and I'm so grateful to it. Oh yeah. Because I realized I didn't know anything. There's nothing to know. Mm -hmm. And then in its in its place came this feeling where I was in the washroom at the time, and everything seemed to disappear. Mm. You know, and and I was there, and all there is is now. You know, that, that's it. This is it. I saw, I saw my face in the mirror in the bathroom, and it appeared strange. Mm -hmm. and, and here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm going through this, appearing as this body now, and I'm playing this role. But I am a being. So you went and, through, um, uh, you went through years of feeling that you knew something, being on television and all yeah. that, and then you had this sort of critical moment where you felt like you didn't know anything. Uh, and then you had this experiential shift. Now do you feel like you know something, or are you living in a state of sort of... Right now, all I can say is that there's nothing to know. Right. 
and everybody is awake. It's just that they don't know it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so whoever I talk to, um, I see them as, um, um, well, they're really part of me. It's just we're all here. We're all mm -hmm. together. Yeah. Yeah. There's so in nothing a, to know. Yeah. So in other words, you know, there are seven billion people in this world, all of whom are on some level awake, but the, the trick is to have that become a conscious living reality. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> That's that to become a conscious reality. I love yeah. the way you things. Yes. Oh, thank you. Well, I didn't coin all these phrases, but I too have read books <laughs> 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 and listened to teachers and so on. Um, <clears throat> Do you feel like there has been a maturation of your experience over the past decade since you had this shift? Yeah, yes, yes. Oh, it's all the time, all the time. Mm -hmm. This is the beautiful thing. It's, it's, um, this is what I get excited about, and this is why I do so many video. You know, I put so many videos on YouTube. Um, yeah, it's exciting. I answer. Uh, all between 40 to 70 email questions a day worldwide, free. Uh -huh. I don't charge. I don't even ask for a donation. And uh, I'm very excited. I, I want everybody to share this incredible feeling. I get up in the morning and um, I call it the I am, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> I am. And uh, I said, I am. Um, you do everything through me, hmm. if, uh, you know, because there isn't me and I am, but um, I'm talking to it because I just want to make sure that I don't identify with the body. Mm -hmm. And so um, I got up and I said, well, you know, you do everything through me from now, from now on. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I keep affirming this. I feel very alive. I feel really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it, it's, it's maturing all the time. How, maybe you could elaborate a little bit on the, the nature of that, of the, of the maturation. I mean, if you, if you trace the course of the last 10 years since the shift took place or since, the, since it became more experiential, how has it matured, I mean, you know, from year to year? Yeah, I, I wish I could put it in words. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, a fine, it's a fine feeling, like I'm happier. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not conscious of my age. Mm -hmm like I, I was before. Um, I feel freer and uh, I become more of a hermit. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. um, I don't care about publicity or advertising myself. Uh -huh. uh, I feel a great love. I'm walking down the street and I'm in love with everybody. You know, mm -hmm. I um, lately I've developed a few cataracts in my eyes and um, I'm not seeing too well. So I take the bus instead of drive the car. I still have the car in shorts in the street, but I take the bus and I get up on the bus and uh, I see the driver smiling at me as I get up and I'm in love with him and I mm. sit down and <laughs> I'm in love with everybody. Um, I guess this is the maturation period. It's um, we're not separate at all, right? You know, and and I see you this morning and as soon as I saw you, uh, it's as if I've known you all my life. Uh -huh. You're my friend. <laughs> uh, this is the maturation. It's very hard to put in words. No, I think it's, you're doing. You're putting it nicely. Um, and it, perhaps if we could choose a single word for all of this, we might use the word appreciation. It's it's as though you're saying that appreciation yeah. has been growing. Gratitude, appreciation. Yeah, yeah. And this actually follows the course of development that I have read and heard from other teachers, which is that. There's a sort of a, a self-realization or, or dawning of awareness, and then the heart begins to grow more. You know, the, yeah, it's yeah. an expansion of the heart. It's just uh, you want to reach out, and if if you see people who are sad, uh, you know, unhappy in their life, and they're making their um, negativity, emotion very real, mm -hmm. uh, your heart goes out and it says, "Hey, man, you know." Look at the miracle called you. Yeah. You know, it's um, yeah. look at what is right now. And uh, the, 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 um, the whole thing is a miracle. It's. Mm. Um, I, I understand that you had a, uh, some involvement with A Course in Miracles for a number of years. Is yeah. that significant to the story? Um, it, is, it is significant. Um, you see, 
I, uh, not so long ago, just a few years ago, I went to Banyan Books. I don't know whether you're aware of it, but it's a well-known uh, in Vancouver. And uh, I, I saw this book by Gary Renard, the, uh, and it was called the, uh, the Disappearance of the Universe. Mm -hmm. Now, in which two people appeared to him. And have you read the book? No. Did you, are you aware of it? No. Uh, oh, okay. I think I heard you mention it in one of your YouTube talks, but I, that's a, all I know. Yeah, and um, a, a lot of people look down upon this story that he, that they felt made up. But as soon as I read the book, I knew that this was real. What was the story? Uh, that the his story, yes, uh -huh. yes, and uh, and he did a, a marvelous job about explaining the Course of Miracles. Uh -huh. I have great respect for A Course of Miracles, and as I read it again after my experience in 2000, um, I, I, I saw how uh, incredibly beautiful it really is. Was he the guy who developed The Course in Miracles or something? No, no. Oh. The Course of Miracles actually happened in 1965. Oh. Uh, it was channeled by... Uh, an elderly Jewish woman who was more or less an agnostic actually and she and she was having trouble um, she was a social psychologist at Columbia University and um, they were having a tough time in the psychology department nobody got along with anybody and, <laughs> and uh, finally she said to her boss uh, look we're not getting along here there's got to be a better way and after she did that, they all agreed that yes, there's got to, there's got to find a better way. She began to hear a voice, hmm. and uh, this voice wouldn't let go. She was afraid to talk about it because she felt that uh, people would see her as schizophrenic. Hmm. But she um, wouldn't rest until she gave in to this voice. And the moment she started writing down what came through her. The voice said, this is a course of miracles, it is a required course. Hmm. And she went on from then, anyway, it, it went on for about seven years, I believe. Uh, I might be missing some of the details here, but... Um, and uh, it was published in 1975, I believe, something like that. I'm not quite sure about the dates. And um, it became a, an underground bestseller, really. It's it's quite it's quite a book. I have great love and respect for it. I haven't read it for quite a while now, but uh, but yeah, it's interesting how that happens. I believe with people, work. certain people are sort of tapped on the shoulder, as it were, and and given a whole package of knowledge, you know, to to bring into the world. And it, in a way, it almost happened to you that way. And you were walking down the street, minding your own business, and all of a sudden, you saw this face of a man. You know, where did that yeah. come from? And, and you know, it makes yes. you wonder, I mean, was it really Ramana Maharshi from the other side or something coming to you? Or That's it, right. It makes you curious about the mechanics of these things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What I came to understand, and, and then again, I, uh, I uh, attribute this to the knowledge that I gained and uh, insight that came from The Course of Miracles, too, mm -hmm. is that what appeared to me wasn't actually Ramana Maharshi. Mm -hmm. Himself, it was the uh, the uh, uh, the Holy Spirit appearing as Ramana Maharshi. Hmm. Uh, I know giving, this giving you a little a, bit. No, that's cool. I mean, and it was sort of giving you a little clue. Is like, okay, look for this guy. Yeah, right? this 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 oneness. Call it the Holy Spirit. Call mm -hmm. it um, the I am appearing as the face of Ramana Maharshi because I needed it at that time. Yeah. You know, so whatever happens to us um, doesn't happen by chance. Right. There are no accidents. What I find I fascinating so about that is that it implies that, you know, the absolute or the uh, the underlying intelligence of the, the the underlying reality of the universe is not a sort of a a, a flat impersonal presence. It's it's an intelligent presence. It's you know? an in it's an infinite intelligence. And it's very caring and loving. See, this is one thing I didn't know. Because when I started um, reading books like on Advaita, prior to my realization, mm -hmm. it, it felt very impersonal. Yeah, dry. 
very dry yeah and these people who um, said that they know all about Advaita and they were very intellectual and they they spoke so well intellectually yet I found no I have found no peace in their eyes I found no um, real clarity yeah. you know joy in their heart love. and what I've experienced love right. and what I experienced in the year 2000 it, it wasn't knowledge per mm -hmm. se like words, it was a feeling, mm -hmm. it was a, an aliveness. Um, how grateful I am to be born a human being, to be who I am, and uh, and it's uh, it's it's a it's a glory. It's it's wonderful, yeah. And if you actually look into the writings of of the fathers of Advaita, you know Ramana, Nisargadatta, Shankara, going back a couple thousand years. I mean, you know, those gentlemen spoke a lot about God and and devotion and so on. It it wasn't just a dry presentation. They also had the feeling That's side right. very much developed. Very much, very much. All you have to do is look into the eyes of Bhagavan Ramana Maharshi, mm. and you see Absolutely. such joy, such bliss, such beauty. Yeah, just you overflowing. Know. Yeah, yeah. I often have tears in my eyes when I just look at his picture. Mm -hmm. You know, because. The, Again, I, I I feel like almost what he's feeling, just like there is a that connection, you know. Yeah. yeah, and so I mean the implication there, not only the implication, but their actual explicit teaching had a lot to do with developing compassion and other yes. other laudable human qualities. You know, it wasn't just the sort of impersonal absolute reality. It was, you know, right. become all you can be as a human being as well. Right, because it's oneness. You see, the personal and impersonal, they're both really one, mm -hmm. you know. And um, it's the same with the body. I mean, we are not the body. The body is an appearance. But still, we need to respect it, to love it. This is why I do Shikung too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, because it's all part of that oneness. You cannot separate the human from the being. It is true that the, the, the human is an appearance of being, because mm -hmm. being is all there is. But yet, through the human, we, we, we have um, certain feelings of separation and unconscious guilt that will drive us towards finding out who we are because all we're looking for is for ourselves mm -hmm. you know I used to um, I do hypnotherapy I call it super sentience and um, and what I what I found out through my own experience of the year 2000 is that negative people people who are um, depressed people who suffer emotional pain are heavily hungering for the being that they are mm. but they don't know it mm. because they blame the outside and um, they think it's happening to them but actually it is their own inner being hungering for that being that they really are yeah you know it is uh, oneness reaching out for itself yeah and and wouldn't you say <clears throat> not just negative people but everyone I mean, it's true to say that that the whole all seven billion of us are on a spiritual quest. Uh, yes. We just most of us don't recognize it as such, but that's you know, right. but that's what it that's, is. Yeah, we're all on a spiritual quest. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's all there is, really. Yeah. And, and that, yeah, you you asked me about how did it mature? Well, it matured because I realized there's nothing else. Hmm. You see, I used to think. You know, when I studied psychology, I was interested in that. Then I, I became, uh, I saw Bhagavan Ramana Maharshi, and I became very interested in meditation. And I wanted to retire to a basement apartment. All I wanted to do was meditation, and, and, and the world, you know, everything else was just nothing, was unimportant. But after this, you begin to realize that everything is important. That doesn't mean it is as real as this, but but this is not separate from anything else everything is this appearing as the negative person appearing as the you know the man who's ignorant mm -hmm. it reminds yeah. me of uh, reminds me of shankara's three rules what was it the world is an illusion brahman alone is real the world is brahman you know so like you just said everything is this meaning that brahman reality everything, appearing everything is a, appearing as bird appearing as the lamp appearing as the dog appearing as you know 
Yeah. Yeah, every, everything is this, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there is no really um, good or bad, right or wrong, should or shouldn't. There is just this, this presence all the mm -hmm. time. Yeah. And yeah. Wouldn't, but would, would you, could you not also say in the same breath that, that what you just said is totally true, but on the other hand, there is good and bad, there is right and wrong, there is hot and cold, fast, yes. and, <laughs> fast and slow. It's like there's this paradox, you know, and you can't just sort of yes. hide, hide half of it under the rug. You sort of have to sort of take it no. all into one big package. <laughs> that, that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. Beautiful. Yeah. Oh, you're, you're, uh, yeah, you're putting it just great. Yes, that's it. Yeah. 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 Nothing and, is separate. But everything is just part of the play, you know. Mm -hmm. I think they call it Leela, don't they? Yeah. And sometimes people try to do that. They try to sort of shut out one whole half of the, the equation and just say, okay, this alone is real. Forget about all that other stuff. You know, don't look at the man behind the curtain. Uh, or else they say, you know, they, they maybe they're totally on the relative side and say there is no yeah. absolute. Um, yeah. But, you know, both. Yeah, both. Both. Mm -hmm. and, and both are one, playing mm -hmm. both parts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a, that, that's, yeah, that's the beautiful thing. You enjoy it all. You know, it's all part of the play. It's, it's, uh, and, and it's wonderful because it's, it's all coming from one primal force, love. Mm. You know, that's, that's all we are um, really working, always recognizing. Yeah, so I go back to what you asked me. So how did it uh, mature? Yeah, I would say that the maturing is greater love capacity. Mm. And there's no limit to it, you know. Yeah, I mean, a year from now, if we were to have, if you were to somehow suddenly be able to jump from what you're experiencing right now to what you're going to be experiencing a year from now, you'd probably notice a contrast. It was like, whoa, okay, yeah. this is even better. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it keeps, getting, it keeps getting better. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. like the Beatles said. <laughs> uh, there's a song, you know. So... Uh, you kind of alluded a little bit ago to emotions and all, and just this morning before our interview, I was reading a piece that you wrote about emotions and um, being able to sort of unravel the, the negative ones, to release their grip in order to, um, as a tool for awakening. Perhaps you could talk about the concepts that you presented in that paper. Sure. Yeah. Um, see, the wonderful thing about uh, emotions, and uh, we do need emotions because emotions, the, the very motion of energy is a seeking, a seeking for who we are. But because we don't know who we are, we suffer from what is called unconscious guilt. Mm -hmm. and unconscious guilt does not mean we've done something wrong. It's a feeling like, I'm not good enough. Mm -hmm. There is something wrong with me. I am missing something. Okay, and all these feelings are coming from the fact that we are ignoring the being that we are, focusing only on the periphery, on the shallow end, which is called the human. Mm. You see, and uh, we need to integrate both. So um, now, many people say the, the important thing here, of course, when you have these uh, strong negative emotions is to be able to look at the emotion as it is and not get caught in its story. So I always say that do not in get attached to the feeling longer than three minutes, because if you do, that's called indulgence. Some people say, well, I'm staying with the feeling of anger, but it doesn't seem to go away, it gets worse. Yes, because you're indulging in it. But if you look at anger as a sensation in the body without its story, then you find that all it is is, a, is you resisting something you don't want. Hmm. Now, that instruction might be easier said than done in, in more extreme cases. I mean, there was just a, a shooting in Arizona, for instance, and a, a little nine-year-old girl got shot. I mean, could you tell her mother to not hang on to the feelings of grief for more than three minutes, you know? I mean, it's, right. it's going to take a while to, to work that one out. Absolutely. She'll be feeling absolutely. something all of her life, probably, in, in, on some Right, level. right, right. So what we can do in a case like that with a mother whose son has been shot or similar um, is uh, we let her talk about it, express her emotions, get them all out. You see, because once you start to express an emotion, then it, it doesn't be, it, it does not get embedded 
in your unconscious. It doesn't stay settled there. It doesn't grow, mm. you know, because sometimes we hold on to pain. And we want to hold on to pain because we want to pay the culprit. We, we want to keep hating the person that caused this. Mm. But what we are doing without realizing it is that we are punishing ourselves. Mm -hmm. So the first stage in a, in a very serious case like that, like the death of a loved one, my goodness, I mean, that's a big one. All we can do at the moment is simply to um, get it out of our system, to grieve, to allow ourselves to grieve, to allow ourselves to feel the pain. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, eventually start slowly releasing it. So I guess what you're saying uh, is there's, yeah. an, there's an appropriate degree to which all these things should be felt, and then there's an inappropriate thing where people sort of indulge in it or hang on to it long after it has served its purpose. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And that keeps them yeah. bound. It keeps them bound, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the reason it keeps them bound is because they want to keep holding on to it. It becomes a way of life. See, some people have said to me, I feel so much anger, I feel so, you know, I worry, I, I, this, 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 and that happens. Mm -hmm. And then I say to them, okay, now, suppose I'll say to you, in another minute or so, I'm going to take all your worries away, all your problems away, everything, I'm going to take everything away. And then they look at me puzzled and they say, do I really want everything wiped out? <laughs> you see, because we think this is our identity, this is who we are, we can't imagine when you when you've been worrying for many many years let's say it's become a habit we can't imagine what it's like to be without that mm. and then we say well what's left there's nothing left but it is that very nothing which is the joy you see it is that very nothingness not even an identity with it that that comes the opening of the heart yeah that, that is a that is a big one for most people yeah. And that's when the human being integrate, because it's okay to be the way you are, just the way you are. Mm -hmm. You know, there are no rules, there's only one law, that's called love. Mm -hmm. You know, you can do away with everything else. Um, so, <clears throat> when we learn to have compassion for ourselves, and um, become totally empty, then what's left? Is, is that love. So what practical steps can a person take to learn that? It depends upon the level of understanding that they have, hmm. how ready they are to, to face the pain that's been haunting them. And so slowly, like when people come to see me one-on-one, -on -one, and, and I do also Skype sessions, mm -hmm. um, then we do several ones. And, uh, and I find immediately whether they are ready to handle it or not. I can see by the way they express, you know, I, I can see it through their eyes, through their voice, mm. how much attached they are. If they are very attached, then I give them techniques, Dif different, different techniques to do. But ultimately, it all, it all comes down to one thing, the, the strength, the courage to release. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, I heard that Ramana Maharshi used to do different approaches like that for different people. To some, he would just give a sort of a mahavakya, you know, that thou art. To others, he would prescribe self-inquiry. To others, he would That's... prescribe meditation. To others, he would prescribe selfless service. It sort of depended upon where the person was at. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. That's why they say there are three kinds of yoga. Bhakti, uh, jnana, and um, uh, hatha. Hatha. Oh. Yeah, karma, karma, right. Karma. Yeah. yeah, yoga of action. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you, so then as a teacher, you attempt to kind of evaluate where a person yes. is at. And, I mean, um, yeah. and, and I give them uh, things to do and, uh, you know, in the same way with the emails, when people ask me questions, it's amazing how much uh, through an email I can tell more or less where the person is at according to what they ask. Right. And then I answer it accordingly. Yeah. You know, all people are beautiful. They're all, everybody is, wants, wants God, you know, wants the being that they are, the I am, because God is love, really. You know, God is not an entity up there. 
it is who you are. Um, but for them to understand that, um, it takes a while. So if I feel that through their question, they're not going to understand that, then I talk more personally to them. Right. Until they move a little deeper and deeper. Yeah. So, so you obviously would be an advocate of the progressive path that people are at different stages of development or awakening and different uh, practices or or knowledge is, is yeah, appropriate uh, for different stages. Yeah. The truth is, however, that there are no stages and there are no levels. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's all here. It is yep. now. But to, to, but to get that impact, to really understand that, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it means that uh, you have not conditioned yourself so much that you cannot see at all. Right. Uh, because some people, if you say to them, your true nature is pure awareness, uh, mm -hmm. they have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. You see, so, so again, so we can say, well, they're not ready to receive that ultimate truth. But, but then again, uh, the moment they realize the ultimate, whatever that means, they get to the point where they say, yeah, I am, I just am, so simple. I am always here, no yep. matter what. It's like you we know, were saying earlier. I'm sorry, go ahead. You know, yeah, to come to that level of saying I am, all that there is as I am, um, it, it takes a few, quote, stages mm -hmm. of understanding. Yeah. yeah. It's like we were saying earlier, you know, it's true that there are no stages. It's also true that there are stages. And <laughs> these, these two things kind of fit together. Or there's an old, there's a Zen saying that, um, you know, enlightenment may be instantaneous or, or spontaneous. Enlightenment may be an accident, but spiritual practice makes you accident prone. <laughs> <laughs> So do you hold like uh, satsangs there as, with little groups or do you mainly uh, just do it all online? I haven't lately. Uh, I'm starting in February um, some uh, workshops, full day workshops for to the, uh, geared towards direct experience of one's true nature. Mm. Uh, people have, I find that um, a lot of people are waking up lately. Um, they're hungering for knowledge. And we are moving very, very fast in this in this age, you know, mm -hmm. especially after 10, 12, for example, is going to become even more sensitive, more geared towards expansion of awareness. So people are more um, open without realizing it. They are. It's just that this whole soul, call it soul, hungering for this knowing. Yeah, um, actually, that was going to be my next question is, you know, among the people that you interact with, have you been seeing the kind of awakenings that you yourself had 10 years ago, or are people sort of popping? Yes, uh, yes, the, uh, the people have changed tremendously. When I talk, I would say that 80% of the people that I get, they know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. more or less. Yeah. At least intellectually they understand it, yeah. So I can move a little faster, yeah. Whereas, um, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it wasn't the same. Mm -hmm. And among those 80% that get what you're talking about, um, are you seeing a pretty good percentage of those having an experiential shift? It's not just that they intellectually get it, but the, their experience is kind of fundamentally and <clears throat> permanently shifting. Um, how permanently shifted they are, I have to be with them all the time to really know that. But I would say that... Uh, yeah, yeah, I have quite a few, I would say, that have reached a point where they're living from what they have realized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To what extent, I, I, I really cannot say. Yeah. Well, like, like we were saying, there's, there's going to be a maturation, so whatever extent it is, it'll be more and more and more. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So a little bit more about this uh, this recent piece you wrote about emotions. Um, is this something that somebody could just do on their own, or do they need to kind of interact with you? And, and maybe you could say a little bit more about what it, exactly it is one does. Yeah, most people need guidance. Mm -hmm. 
that doesn't mean that they need a teacher because they are their own teacher. But some people are so conditioned through the identification with who they think they are that they give in immediately the moment an emotion takes over. So, so sometimes if they have a person with them who has realized, you know, the, the true nature, mm -hmm. um, the presence enough of the teacher would be, would be more of a catalyst to the realization of themselves. So this is where a workshop would be good because uh, by, by being in that atmosphere, um, their chances of uh, having a direct experience are greater than if they were to, to do it by themselves. Yeah. It takes a certain maturation to, to really uh, work on yourself by yourself. Something in you has to develop. It's called devotion to truth. Mm. And that devotion to truth takes quite a while to yeah. come to fruition. And the, uh, the traditional scriptures actually place great value on uh, satsang or on, on being in the company of the enlightened or that's, seek, that's, seekers of truth and all. They, they regard that as a powerful technique mm -hmm. in, in and of itself. Yes, yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it's kind of like if you had a little piece of wood or something just sitting by itself and you tried to get it burning, it, it might be hard, but if you sort of throw it in a fire with a whole lot of other pieces of wood that are burning, <laughs> oh. you know, the, the whole thing yeah, goes. Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good example. Yeah, uh, even, uh, even damp wood will get burning if it's thrown in the fire. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's the point. That's that's the point of a, a workshop. It's not so much giving words, giving example, because people have read a lot. There's so many books. Everybody has some knowledge of truth, at least intellectually. But um, a workshop on direct experience, straight direct experience, is would be very very good. Yeah. yeah. So if, like if somebody comes to one of your workshops, um, they don't just sit and listen to you talk. There, there's some experiential component to it. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I will, I will interact with with the questions more. For example, uh, if somebody asks me, um, you know, can I feel God? And uh, I, I don't say, well, this is what you do. <laughs> I'll say, what do you mean by God? Mm -hmm. You see. So, by, by hitting it directly, you know, you ask the person direct questions, you open up their own way of asking, because we're never, we're never really saying what we're feeling, hmm. you know. Um, uh, one time I asked a person, uh, and they said, uh, I, I said to them, he said, well, how, how, how do you know that awareness is all there is? And I said, uh, do you know that you exist? And he said, yes, of course. I said, well, how do you know? He said, because I'm aware that I exist. I said, that's it. Uh -huh. said, yeah. So awareness is self-recognizing. So this is how a person has a direct experience by actually hitting upon the fact that they know that they know, but they don't know that they know. Hmm. So you make them know that they know <laughs> by, yeah. again, uh, you know, making them recognize how simple it is when you look at itself. Ramana Maharshi used to call it inquiry, self-inquiry. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're kind of helping them notice something that's been there all along, but they have just overlooked it. That's right, and they overlooked it, yeah. 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 Like and look, direct look at, looking for your glasses look. when they're sitting on your head or something. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, you were about to say? Uh, no, no, I, I guess uh, that's... Something about direct experience, I think you were just going to say. Yeah, yeah, direct experience is um, making the person know exactly what they're really asking, mm. what they're really wanting. Because all the time we're all seeking the same thing, but people think they are seeking something different. For example, um, I gave a talk lately at, um, at the Road College of Counselors, and um, I asked them one question, and I said, what is it you want more than anything? No, no, sorry, no, the question was, what is the most important thing there is? Mm -hmm. And some, you know, some say 
power or fame or love or um, God or their religion or whatever. But the point is, what what is, for example, you chose happiness. What is happiness without being aware that you're happy? You see what I mean? So, in other words, without awareness, um, uh, nothing can exist without awareness. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah. It's yeah. sort of the... Uh, it's like... Okay. You could use the an analogy of electricity. I mean, you might have the world's best television, but it's not going to run for you unless you can plug it in. So, it's sort of <laughs> like... It's awareness is kind of the juice that, that powers juice. All, all experiences, you know? A, yes. Awareness is the very presence you are. Yeah. It is this truth itself. It is the it is the unborn in you or the deathless in you. Yeah. Now some would argue that awareness is just a function of the brain, you know, and that when the brain dies, no more awareness, no more consciousness. But what gave birth to the brain? Yeah, I mean that's what I would ask, but uh, I think yeah. may, to play devil's advocate, I suppose someone some would say, well, it's just you know, obviously there's DNA and there's genetic reasons why life grows, and and you know awareness doesn't have anything to do with it. O o the brain creates awareness, not the other way around. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, this is the intellectual mind, but you mm -hmm. see, we'll always go back to awareness because awareness is that primal energy. Even scientists, for example, have discovered energy is indestructible. Mm. It simply changes form. Mm -hmm. So all the form that we see, whether it's a brain or whatever, has come from this changeless energy. And this changeless energy, what is it? It's infinite intelligence, isn't it? Mm. And what is infinite intelligence? Awareness of itself. That's my perspective awareness. on it. I, I have a good friend yeah. who, who listens to some of these interviews, and he's, he, he kind of espouses the perspective that I was just voicing, you know, about kind of a materialistic perspective. But I sometimes try to put myself in his shoes and, you know, sort of ask questions he would ask to. But, I mean, even from, as you're saying, from a perspective of science, if you break everything down, molecular, atomic, subatomic, you very quickly come to a, a point where it's just mostly empty space with a few virtual fluctuations taking place there's no material substance <laughs> that's right no material substance at all yeah. so what is it that non-material that creates the material out of itself you see yeah and it has to be intelligent because life is intelligent yeah and that is awareness it amazes me that a doctor or a scientist or an astronomer or you know someone who spends their life looking at things under a microscope could ever be an atheist you know because you, you look at the sort of the the incredible intelligence that's involved in even operating a single cell and you know it's just awe inspiring right. it's awe inspiring absolutely mm. absolutely yes yeah yeah, this is, this is what I mean. People say, well, what do you mean by awakening? And uh, this is what awakening is, is exactly what you described. It's, it's when you see the, the miracle, it's awe inspiring. A, a single cell, yeah, my God. You yeah. know, <laughs> look at life and, yeah. you know, you just have to have a look and, and you see the, the wonder right there. And, uh, we, we and, might. Uh, the average person becomes a, the average person, what? Your yes. voice broke up. You, you said the average well, the person. average person becomes so dead to it. You know, yeah. so um, when I say dead, it means asleep to the very wonder that they are. Yeah. They have stopped looking. They have stopped asking. They have stopped inquiring. And so what is necessary is that all knowledge is within. All real knowledge, heartfelt knowledge is all within the person. Mm -hmm. So all a teacher does is not teach, but actually help the person to know how much they really know if they are open-hearted enough to look, to see. Yes, yeah. 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 Just we, like you were saying. We were talking earlier about how, you know, this um, ultimate reality is not just sort of mere, it's not sort of a flat, dry presence merely, but, it is, but it's intelligence. And so, you know, the implication is that Obviously, awakening to that level of life, one 
realizes one's essential identity with or unity with that level of in, that, that intelligence which is governing the universe. In other words, oneness with God, I and my Father are one. And um, that's right. So, that's beautiful. you know, imagine the richness of that experience. It's not just sort of, okay, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sort of a colorless blob of being. It's more like, you know, I am that fount of creativity which gives rise to everything, which governs the cells, the, the galaxies and all. And obviously, I'm not speaking here of I as an individual because I, I couldn't, you know, create a housefly, but I as that, as that, um, you know, as that intelligence which expresses itself as me, as you, as beautiful. as everything. <laughs> yes, that was beautifully put. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Um, hmm. So, what haven't we covered? I mean, this is very sweet, and you've kind of given us a little biographical sketch of, of how things have developed for you. Um, is there something important I'm leaving out? Um, no, we covered the, the major theme, the presence, that there's only one presence appearing as you and me and everyone else, um, and it is all we're striving for, it is all we ever want, it is all we ever seek, and it is all we are, mm. and it's eternal, and I guess that kind of sums it up, yeah. you know, the, and it's all real, it's all this is as well, you know. It's it's not. This just, is yes. Yeah. That includes every. Yeah. Nothing is left out. Nothing. Nothing. Yeah. yeah. And that to me is what non-duality really means. Is it's not just that there's sort of a non-dual unified state at some deep level. It's more like this is the uh, non-dual. You know, you want this. All of this is that. <laughs> all of this is. When I look into my cat's eyes, I see God. Yeah. Some people might think I'm <laughs> I'm exaggerating. No, I, I I feel it. I feel it. Mm -hmm. I, I talk to my cat and uh, I, I hold him, and he's he's incredibly uh, loving, purring, and yeah, you know, so affectionate. And uh, yes, yeah, that's I see God. Yeah, and and I can't yeah. honestly say that I always see that at all. I mean, you know, there's a there's a deep intuitive sense of it and understanding of it, but I feel that there's a great degree of uh, maturation again there's that word which can yeah. take, which will take place for me over time which which will you know i mean for instance you know if if i were suddenly to somehow step into the perspective that ramana maharshi had of life i'm sure i would notice a vast contrast between what i'm experiencing and what he was experiencing you know so i i just want to sort of suggest that these people who sort of say, oh, I'm I, w I went to this weekend seminar, I, I am awakened, I got it, non-dual, everything's an illusion. Um, you know, we're all just in kindergarten, com you know. In yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. We're, we're growing all the time. There's never a time when we can say, I've arrived, you know. <laughs> yeah. So if somebody asks me, are you awake, are you enlightened? <laughs> All I can see is laugh because it's this, this, we are, we just are. Yeah. No one is in love. Or you could say, you know, there's to a degree, but there's more, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, much more. Yeah. yeah, yeah, just expanding all the time. Yeah. That's the beautiful, there is no ego in it at all. It's just, there's just this oneness, this love, yeah. And some people, if they hear you yeah, talk that, that way, they'll say, oh, <laughs> then you haven't given up the search. You should give up the search and then you'll really be there. Uh, what, what, what do you see? have you heard no. that that way of speaking? <clears throat> no, they haven't said that to me. But um, but th there is no search anymore because yeah. it's it's here. Yeah, it's it's I see it everywhere. If I, I got my cat and I look into his eyes, I am there. If I I, I look at anybody uh, in the street, I'm there. Yeah. it's. Um, so it's not a matter of reading or studying about it or seeking. There's, there's nowhere to go. There's nothing to to uh, to grasp. It's it's here. Exactly. It's now. It's this presence. It's this breath. It's this breathing. It's it's looking, touching, feeling, knowing. It's beautiful. all of these. Yeah. Yeah. It's very beautiful. Yeah. Um, and mm -hmm. and and yet, paradoxically, 
you you were saying that certainly there is more growth yet to undergo. So I'm just I'm bringing out the point that yeah, acknowledging the fact that there can be more growth doesn't mean that you're some kind of desperate seeker who's who's overlooking the beauty of now. I, the two go hand in hand. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Being and the becoming are one. Right. right. Yeah. The two opposites are one. This is the um, this is the movement of life. Yeah. yeah. Good. Well, you're a beautiful man. You have this sort of loving also be are you. beauty so in are your you. eyes, and <laughs> you know. And in fact, yeah. you look you look a lot like uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi did when he got old and lost his hair. He, he had this a, a facial structure similar to yours, and and you know, and that that knowingness in his eyes. Uh, he, he was my <laughs> he was my teacher for many years. Um, oh, uh huh. Yeah. So you know, I, I really yeah. appreciate having had this opportunity to speak with you. Um, oh, you're very beautiful, Rick. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. It was it was a joy being with you. Yeah. It takes one to it know was. one, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me just conclude by saying that you have been listening to. Uh, an interview uh, with Bert Harding. My name is Rick Archer, and this is a show which is called Buddha at the Gas Pump. The implication of that term being that in ordinary everyday circumstances, you may meet some enlightened people in this day and age. They're everywhere. Um, <laughs> and uh, we'll do, we do one once a week. Um, they're available on YouTube, as a podcast, on Facebook. And the, the home page for it all is batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P. Oh, they're all archived there, and you can find links to higher resolutions of the videos on YouTube and Facebook and so on. And um, my next interview will actually be tomorrow night, uh, although you won't see this uh, in one day after you see this one because it takes a while to produce them, but it's going to be with Genpo Roshi, who is a, a Zen teacher. Mm. So thank you again, Bert. And thank you thank to you. all my listeners, and we will see you next time.